Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this session on energy transition towards climate neutrality, the EU support for clean energy technologies and innovation. My name is Hans Van Steen, and I will be moderating this uh, session this afternoon. I'm an acting director in DG Energy here in the European Commission. It's my pleasure, first of all, to introduce you to the two keynote uh, speakers this afternoon. In fact, they don't really need an introduction, but I'll do it anyway. So we have Commissioner Kadri Simpson for you, uh, responsible for energy in the uh, von der Leyen Commission. And we have Mr. Fatih Birol, who is the IEA Executive Director, a uh, post he has been holding uh, since 2015. Uh, so we will hear keynote interventions by uh, Mrs. Simpson and Mr. Birol in just a moment. Before we get to that, I will just uh, give you um, a notice that we also have with us this afternoon, Mechthild Wurstorfer, who's a director in DG, in uh, the IEA, uh, responsible for uh, sustainability, technology and outlooks. Uh, and she will be joining us uh, in about half an hour uh, to deal with the question and answer session as well. Um, that session will be conducted as a Slido uh, experience, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, but I'll just uh, let you know how it works. You will actually see at the bottom of your screen, once we get going with our two keynote speeches, you will see the Slido segment where you can type in directly your question, which we can then deal with after the two keynote speeches. That is, of course, assuming that you are able to both type and listen at the same time. But I assume that many of you will be expert multitaskers in this sense. So uh, I'm sure that will work out very well. With those few opening remarks, I would like to hand over the floor to uh, Mrs. Simpson, Commissioner. You have the floor for an intervention of about 15 minutes, Commissioner. Thank you, Hans. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Perol, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the session. I'm very happy uh, to be here speaking with you all, um, especially today, because as uh, clean energy technologies and innovation, they are well, very important for us. The last few months have forced us uh, to focus on the present. At times it felt um, that life was stopped in its tracks. But this week, is firmly about our future and our hopes for it. There's uh, no better expression of hope in the future than innovation. If we innovate because uh, we know that a better world is possible, so we push ourselves to the limit of our activity. Yet vision without execution is just a daydream. That's absolutely not going to get us to the climate neutral Europe by 2050. Um, foresight and determination will. And we will release um, our first ever clean energy transition technologies and innovations report together with the State of Energy Union report uh, this autumn. But before we have these results, I want to share with you already today our thinking on clean energy technologies. To be precise, the why, the what, and the how we plan to innovate. Uh, our way towards climate neutrality. And I'll begin with a why. So um, we have always innovated. We have always searched for uh, new ways and means to improve our lives. It's in our nature, whether it's because we had a dream, just like the Wright brothers who wanted to be the first people to fly, or even if it was um, to better arrival, just like the space race in the 50s. So the question is, what is the reason to innovate here and now in Europe? In, uh, in this moment for Europe, I see three reasons. First, we need innovative technolo technologies to reach our targets. Our vision of climate neutral 2050 without the technologies to support it will not become a reality. We need breakthrough change, which only innovation can bring. Uh, otherwise, we risk a transition that takes longer, is more costly, is less efficient and makes the social impact more difficult to bear for citizens. The second reason is that our clean energy technology industry has taken a real hit in that crisis. 
but it translates to a fragile European solar and wind industry. Orders have fallen by around 30%. To ensure their survival, we need to intervene. And the third reason to focus on de uh, developing clean energy technologies is to boost European competitiveness. Yes, we are the front runner when it comes to clean energy technologies right now, but uh, we shouldn't be too complacent about that. Uh, this crisis will challenge that position. And we don't want to fail to, size, uh, to seize the right moment. It has happened before in the early stages of the digital transition. Europe was leading the pack in building a digital infrastructure. We let our early advantage go to waste and Europe lost out while non-European companies became household names. Now again, in clean energy technologies, other regions are quickly catching up. If we want to avoid history repeating itself, this is a moment to push for greater clean energy innovation. So I have explained the why. Now let's consider on uh, what exactly should we do, uh, focusing our innovation on that clean energy sphere. Let's start with where we need to make the biggest leap. This is hydrogen. The first thing we need to consider is uh, that by 2050, we are looking to a European power system that will be based on more than 80% renewables. A key asset underpinning the number of the potential of hydrogen. So by 2050, it has the potential to reach 13%. Um, as um, attractive that number is, we are very far from uh, there right now. Um, today, it reaches just about 2% of the total energy mix. So we have neither the market nor the infrastructure yet to improve on that number. Think of it uh, like a formula. The cost of renewable hydrogen is dependent on the cost of renewable electricity, plus the cost of electrolyzers. So these are the areas where we need to scale up for electrolyzers, the costs have already been reduced by 60% in the last 10 years. But still, we need to scale up even further to reach the numbers we need. Uh, for renewable electricity, we are making progress. Look at offshore wind. The technological challenge is um, the size of turbines. Um, they can produce more for longer, and we can combine reduced electricity costs with a reduced demand for flexibility. We are getting there. Um, on average, turbine capacity has increased by 12% every year since 2014. Also, these solutions bring with them a whole set of um, challenges. Larger turbines also need high voltage direct current technologies ready and able to deal with uh, the new capacities. After the summer, we will present our offshore renewable strategy that will help um, deal with these challenges. Solar PV is another source of renewable electricity and uh, where there is a great potential for upscaling if we have the right technologies to do, so, do it. Just like offshore wind, the cost has reduced dramatically over the past decade. In Germany, for example, the cost of residential solar PV systems have decreased almost three times over the last 10 years. By the end of last year, we had a installed capacity of solar PV over 134 gigawatts. To reach net zero, that needs to increase exponentially to 320 gigawatts by 2030, and then 1,000 gigawatts by 2050. The technology needs to be market ready um, at each milestone. I'll also, I'll also mention batteries. It goes without saying that uh, the more we generate renewable electricity, the more we need flexibility and storage technologies as well. We get greater energy density for batteries for areas that um, need it, like um, e-mobility. For batteries, upscaling works differently than uh, for turbines. At least for lithium technology, the cell size remains the same, but its performance increases quickly. In the EU, the biggest battery installation so far is about 90 megawatts. We estimate that uh, we are lagging behind in battery production by about five years, so we have a clear area to work on. We have the why and the what, so let's finally consider the how. How 
I will go into push of greater deployment of clean energy technologies. How do we know where to focus our attention? The first stop is identifying where to focus, where to focus our energies. And this is the role of the clean energy transition technologies and innovation report I mentioned earlier. This is in our hands. We have our finger on the pulse um, of clean energy technologies development. We can also map out exactly where we are top of the class and lagging behind. And we can already see which technologies are coming down uh, the line. It gives us a compass to help us steer our policies and funding choices. Funding clean technologies has uh, gotten a massive boost recently through the recovery plan for Europe that the Commission proposed a few weeks ago. The Green Deal is its growth strategy at its core. So it is perfectly designed to help accelerate innovative investment um, through a number of programs. First, the reinforced multi-annual multi financial framework with a proposed increase in Horizon Europe to 94 billion euros. We bring extra resources for the digital and green transitions. Horizon will allow us to support the most innovative new ideas, something we cannot even imagine at the moment. Uh, but what could be the next breakthrough solution? We invest the EU research and innovation window of uh, 10 billion euros. And this help to scale up private sector investments and research and innovation. Most importantly, it will help downstream bringing the results of the market and seeing a tangible solution. We have also created a new strategic investment facility to support private investments in European strategic value chains uh, with a guarantee of um, 15 billion euros. So if you are planning to invest in clean hydrogen technologies, for example, you could use the strategic investment facility for projects to scale up, electrolyzers, or for carbon capture and storage solutions. What we are trying to do with this combined financial firepower is um, cover all stages of the innovation life cycle. Together, they will help us move into global leadership position. Before we unlock those new major funds under the next MFF, in July, a first 1 billion euro call under the Innovation Fund will be launched. It will fund, amongst other things, demonstration project for innovative hydrogen-based and renewable technologies. Soon after, in September, we will adopt a Green Deal call of 950 million euros under Horizon 2020. Of that, more than one third will be dedicated to energy topics, including a call for a larger scale electrolyzers. The private sector also has a very important role in funding clean energy technologies. In fact, private investments still represent roughly three quarters of research and innovation funding. That's why we will also launch a new hydrogen alliance to bring public and private to the same table. To have the greatest impact, we need to leverage the best of both sectors while setting um, sites and joint goals. Joining forces will build up a pipeline of projects and uh, drive our innovative technologies further. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the why, the what, and the how. The easiest question to answer of all is when. The answer is now. Time is not on our side. It takes decades to turn around an industrial and technological system. But right now we have political buy-in across the board of the need to act on climate issues. The Green Deal offers us the momentum we need for full-scale investment of clean energy technologies and innovation. Now it is the time to act before climate change reminds us of Martin Luther King's words, in life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is our roadmap for developing and deploying clean energy technologies in Europe. This is where, with your help, Europe wants to make a difference. Now I'm looking forward to hearing the international perspective. Dr. Fatih Pirol, thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, for a very inspiring uh, speech and for really highlighting the very close relationship between our policy objectives and the role that energy technology has to play in order for us to get there, and also for linking in very clearly to the recovery from the current crisis situation in which we find ourselves linked to the uh, global pandemic. So I thought that was very inspiring. And indeed, as you said, we're now looking very much forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Birol, uh, the IEA's perspective. And in fact, Mr. Birol, you have been uh, during the leadership you've uh, conducted for the IEA, you have uh, really engaged in a comprehensive modernization program. And as one part of that, you are undertaking an effort to make the IEA the global hub for clean energy technologies and energy efficiency, which is something which, of course, we all very much welcome. So we're looking forward to hearing from you uh, this afternoon. Dr. Birol, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting us, uh, first of all, uh, and uh, uh, for your kind words, uh, Mr. Fanstein. And uh, thank you very much to Madam Commissioner for this uh, enlightening speech, laying down the vision for Europe and the uh, European uh, Green Deal. So first of all, Madam Commissioner, may I take this opportunity to congratulate you and your colleagues but I start from the most important thing, addressing the COVID crisis, the, the health crisis in Europe, by and large, in a very successful way. Now, after this, focusing on the economy and our future clean energy. So all of these three pieces, uh, under the leadership of the key decision makers in uh, Brussels and in the European capitals, are as far as I can see, going in the right direction. And as such, I think Europe is uh, becoming a role model for many countries around the world. And I wanted to congratulate you for the first success story, not yet finished, but the COVID, uh, uh, fighting against COVID, but also economic recovery and also the uh, uh, designing a European uh, Green Deal. So congratulations for the leadership and uh, vision. Madam Commissioner, uh, dear colleagues, uh, when we uh, look at the world, of course, we know that the uh, Europe is important, but it's an uh, important part of the world, but there are other countries who are uh, key around the world. And when we look at the entire world, which the International Energy Agency does, how the COVID affected us, energy world. I will give you only two numbers. One. We expect the global energy demand will decline this year sharply. And to put in a context, seven times bigger decline compared to the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Seven times more than that. A huge decline of global energy demand across the world. This is number one. Number two, CO2 emissions. Huge decline around the world. This year's decline in global emissions erases the growth in the last 10 years globally. So last 10 years growth is erased in only this year's decline, big decline. But if you ask me if it is something that we should be happy about, I would say no. Why? Because it is not happening as a result of right energy policies, but it is happening because of the economic trauma in many uh, countries around the world and premature deaths of people around the world. It is not as a result of right policies. And now comes the danger, the challenge. In the past, we have seen emissions decline as a result of the economic crisis, such as 2008, 2009. But with the economic recovery, they rebound very strongly. People who have a good memory would remember that 2010 economic recovery meant highest ever emission increase in the world, in the history. So therefore, in my view, we have two jobs in Europe and around the world in front of us. Number one, avoiding the rebound of the current emissions, and second,
put the world on a track which could end up with a net zero emissions. Two important targets, avoid the rebound and go to net zero. But we are at the IEA, we don't live a different planet. We live in this planet and we know that the governments around the world are worried about the economic growth and jobs. They are top priorities and rightly so. But we also say that the climate change is very important. Therefore, in line with the name of this uh, week, we made a special report, a sustainable recovery report. And the sustainable recovery report, why we did it, very simple. Many governments around the world are putting huge amount of recovery packages and how they are going to be designed will determine the future of our economy and energy systems. So therefore, if this recovery will be sustainable or not is critical and uh, responding to calls around the many governments around the world, we made a sustainable recovery together with the International Monetary Fund, with IMF. And we look at the next three years, what needs to be done? We think, looking at all the energy policies around the world, we think there are three areas that the governments need to focus in order to have a sustainable recovery. Number one, renewable energies, especially solar and wind. Number two, energy efficiency, especially renovation of buildings. Number three, extension and modernization of the power grids. These three can bring us a sustainable recovery, we think. It can help the economic growth. It can help us to create new jobs. And they can also make the 2019 as a definitive peak of emissions and they can decline. And here, I wanted to also put a big emphasis on energy efficiency. Because energy efficiency, we believe, is a very important tool for economic growth, but especially jobs. In my view, energy efficiency is a job-making machine. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Energy efficiency can create these jobs, especially renovation of buildings in Europe and elsewhere can create a lot of jobs and give a lifeline to construction sector. And in Europe, about 75% of the older buildings today were built before the 1990 European regulations to provide tough standards for the uh, buildings. And they need a lot of uh, renovation there. So these policies, renewables, efficiency, modernization, strength in the grids can help us to bring the uh, emissions down and making sure that 2019 peak will not be uh, repeated. It will go down. But this is good. Excellent, but not enough. We want to see that uh, there will be a zero emission coming in Europe and around the uh, world. And the net zero emission goals need beyond these three policies I men mentioned to you. What is the magic word? For me, the magic word for zero net emissions is one word. Innovation. In the absence of innovation of critical clean energy technologies, we have no chance whatsoever to reach the net zero emission goals. And in terms of Europe, innovation in which technologies? There are many technologies that we can look into, but in my view, Europe should focus two important technologies, which are in line with the European economy, industry characteristics, and European energy sector. Madam Commissioner, 
uh, when we know each other better, you will understand that I am a big football fan. And there is a Dutch football player who is very famous called Johan Cruyff. I like him very much, a philosopher. He said, if you want to win the match, you have to keep the eye on the ball. You have to keep the eye. It's very simple, but there's a big philosophy behind that, in my view. And in my view, Europe keeping the eye on the ball and innovation is focusing on two technologies which are ready for the big time, which are hydrogen electrolyzers and batteries. And they are now there where the solar energy was 10 years ago. But in my view, Europe this time shouldn't repeat the mistake Europe did in the solar. Push the solar, give the subsidies, but somebody else took it over and have the leadership. I think we should learn uh, from that. We are going to, only in two weeks of time, uh, providing our uh, energy technology perspectives uh, report, which is uh, the world's guidebook for clean energy technologies, which is focused for innovation for Europe and beyond. My final point, I praise Europe, I praise the European leadership. No question about that. But this is not enough. This is not enough. One ton of CO2 going to atmosphere from Lille or from Detroit or from Jakarta or uh, from Shanghai, it has the same effect on everybody. Climate change is a global issue. And Europe is responsible about 8% of the global emissions. Therefore, it is very important that the Europe's leadership provides inspiration for the rest of the world. And yet there is a huge opportunity here. And I am thankful to Madam Commissioner and Vice President Timmermans that they have accepted to join IEA's 9th of July Clean Energy Summit. We have, uh, Mr. Chairman, more than 40 ministers around the world joining the IEA Clean Energy Summit. Ministers from Canada, US, Brazil, Chile, all European countries, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, all of the ministers, about 80% of the global GDP coming and discussing how we can have a sustainable recovery all together. And I am thankful to Madam Commissioner and uh, Vice President Timmermans coming and telling us, hopefully, Madam uh, Commissioner, about your uh, uh, Green Deal, your vision, your ambitions. I am sure it will be an inspiring uh, vision for all the governments uh, participating in this uh, meeting. And I am very sure that the, your meeting, uh, our meeting, with this meeting, we are providing an example uh, around the world which policy is first, which technology is second, but one uh, issue is unquestionable. We need economic growth, we need jobs, but we also need a clean energy future. I am sure, as you know, we are getting a lot of questions. I am sure, Madam Commissioner, you too, they are telling me, I uh, hear yes, talking about the clean energy, but the global economy is melting. I tell them, yes, global economy is melting, but the Arctic ice cap is also melting. We have to address both of these issues, and they are not exclusive. I thank you very much, uh, Madam Commissioner, for inviting the IEA here, and also uh, to you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. But I want to reassure you that the IEA will continue to lead the global clean energy transitions in partnership with the European uh, Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Birol. Uh, again, I think this was a very inspiring speech and a very good introduction to the debate that we're going to have in a moment. In fact, what I take away from what you said is that the IEA's take on 
innovation and energy transition is very, very close to how we see things also here in the Commission, both in terms of the three key priority that you mentioned about renewables, energy efficiency, and grid modernization. These are all areas where the EU and the Commission is pushing ahead as fast as we can. And I think when you talked about two key technologies that we need to focus on, these are also very much on our uh, mind for the moment, uh, hydrogen, where we are working on a, on a strategy, and also batteries, where we have already launched quite a lot of work, including setting up a battery alliance with key uh, industry players. So I think we see very much eye to eye, and I look very much forward to continuing uh, our very fruitful uh, cooperation on these uh, points. Um, at this stage, I think we would like to thank very much our two keynote uh, speakers, and I see Dr. Birol has already at least paused. I don't know if he has left us, but he has suddenly disappeared here from my screen. But I would like really to thank him very much for taking time uh, this afternoon and for giving us his insights. And uh, I would Lord, equally like to uh, warmly thank uh, Commissioner Simpson. Uh, it's been very, very good to have you with us uh, this afternoon. And in normal circumstances, we would have had a big round of applause. But um, I think I'm talking on behalf of everyone when we are grateful for your presence here today. So thank you very much indeed, and uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. With that, I think we can pass on to uh, our second uh, part of this session, and I now see uh, Mechthild Wurstorfer in the picture. Uh, very warm welcome to you as well. Uh, Mechthild, as I said in the beginning, you're the director of the International Agency Sustainability Technology and Outlooks Directorate. I still have to say this in the right way. Uh, we are very happy that you are here and will uh, try and, and respond to some of the issues and questions that will be raised via Slido. And indeed, as Dr. Birol just said, there are already quite a few of them coming in. I think uh, while we start to kick off on that, we will open up with the so-called uh, Slido poll, which I hope you should be able to see on your screen uh, here. I don't know if that is the case. Uh, it is coming uh, there. And uh, you will see what we would like you to try and indicate to us, just to kick us off, is to indicate what you think are the main drivers of the energy transition. And there are uh, six options here, and I don't think I need to read them out because you can read them out for yourselves. And we'll just give you a few moments to um, put your views in here. I see there are very few people who think that digitalization has a role to play. Ah, there's a few there. That's very good. Um, very good. I think we can already see uh, a clear tendency here. And maybe, Mekhti, this is a good point for you to kick off uh, and tell us what you think this poll actually tells us. This is, of course, not a, necessarily a representative poll, but this is what the people who are sitting, listening to us this afternoon uh, think. So uh, I think it is important that we try and respond to that. Uh, so Mekhti, do you want to uh, say a, a word or two about that? Please. Thank you very much, Hans. I'm very pleased to be part of that discussion. As Dr. Fatih Birol just said, innovation and technology are at the heart of our work and at the heart of clean energy transitions. So I'm very pleased to start this question and answer session. And let me just um, go back to the results of that important poll. It's not anymore on my screen, but I uh, saw a big winner there. And that is the legally binding targets for CO2 renewables energy efficiency, which got nearly half of all the votes, 45, 48% right now. A second driver for energy uh, transition, maybe not a surprise in that session, is technological innovation, around 22% right now. Third, that is citizen engagement through energy communities, prosumers, other means. That's 12%, pretty much in line with the next one, which are markets and competition. And then a fifth point, 
here in the poll replies is international and intra-EU cooperation. And the last one, digitalization. So for me, frankly, it's not so much surprising to see that strong, strong role of legally binding targets. The EU had done a fantastic job with the 2020 targets, the energy climate framework for 2030, and now with the 2050 carbon neutral target. And starting with 2020, and Hans remembers that well, there was a lot of pull and push for that. Followed by technological innovation, clearly that is the subject of this debate, but also remarkable, I think, um, that international cooperation and intra-EU is between fourth and fifth point, it's changing a little bit. And maybe the digitalization one is not yet there, but maybe that is something for the future. So thank you very much for this introductory poll and thank everyone for replying so rapidly. Thank you very much, uh, Mechthild. Uh, I think indeed it, it does show two things, the, the poll. It shows certainly that we need a clear uh, policy drive uh, towards uh, energy transition, and that can, of course, come via setting uh, legally binding targets. But at the same time, and I think Dr. Birol said that, and I think the commissioner as well, that it's very clear that if we do not have a very significant innovation, it's going to be very, very difficult to meet the targets that we are setting ourselves. So the things go really hand in hand, and maybe it's difficult to separate them uh, as, as we just saw. Um, we will now try and bring in some of the, the questions, and I hope they will uh, appear on our screen uh, in a moment. We should have some very clever people who are uh, trying to uh, bring the questions up here so that uh, we can see them. Uh, if not, I will go to my own little Slido advice here. Um, and the, the one which I see is for the moment the most popular, and I don't see it on my screen here, so I'll read it out from my phone, um, is a, a question from John uh, Prime, who says that everybody seems to mention flexibility, and then they think immediately about batteries. And he would like to hear what our thoughts are on demand side flexibility. And that's a, a question that has uh, got quite a few votes. So I think that's maybe something that we need to think a little bit about. Mechthil, do you want to kick off uh, on that? I know you see here it is actually on the screen. It, it appeared in the end, so that's very good. And you see the question I just read out for you is uh, the first one there from John uh, Prime. Um, demand side flexibility, uh, Mechthil, what are your views on that? So thank you very much. And thank you for, for all the questions popping up right now. Uh, I can see them now. So I think it's, it's a very good question because it's true that for years in the energy policy and uh, analysis, even on the clean energy transitions, we were very much focused on the supply side. But more and more, obviously, we see coming in the demand side. And demand side flexibility is an issue we should, to, from my point of view, even concentrate more. We can do much more. And here, partly digitalization comes in, but all other means to have that demand side flexibility. And I think the Commission and also the IEA has been working on that flexibility when it comes to market designs, where, as I said, in the old times, it was focused on supply. Now we look at demand and, and, and supply and look at how can that be matched. So the market design is there. And obviously, in that context, batteries play a key role. But it's true, it's a good question that we should also look more, and that is probably not as much as it should be in the policy debate on the demand side flexibility and all the means there. So we would certainly from the commission side see that in the same way. There is a lot of potential in demand side flexibility that we do need to exploit. I think Flexibility comes in many different ways, and obviously creating more and better storage, for example, through batteries, but perhaps also other types of storage is one way. Demand side flexibility is another. A better interconnections uh, between different markets is, is a third one, and we need to pursue 
all of those. And maybe I'll just a small observation here when it comes to the demand side flexibility there. I think there's a lot of uh, potential in innovation and technology. And um, when, I, when I saw that relatively few people voted in the poll for digitalization as a driver for the energy transition, I think um, that, that could be an issue because I think a lot of the demand side flexibility has to be driven by uh, digitalization because a lot of that flexibility will have to appear automatically. Uh, you're not going to get uh, a lot of this to happen manually. This will have to come via uh, smart apps and all sorts of other ways of um, facilitating uh, demand side flexibility. So uh, for us, this is really important and we have quite a few projects on that uh, ongoing within both Horizon uh, 2020, and I hope also within the next uh, Horizon uh, program. Um, I will um, go to the next question, which is also a very popular question. It's about hydrogen, and I think we heard both uh, Commissioner Simpson, but also Fatih Birol talk about the role of hydrogen uh, in the energy transition. And the question here from an anonymous user is how can we ensure that the hydrogen will be truly green and renewable? And I think uh, that is another vital question. Mechthil, do you want to uh, comment on, on that? Yeah, thank you very much, um, Hans. And it, it's true, hydrogen, it's pretty top on the agenda. It's in every energy conference, I would say, not only focusing on technology and last year, there was a big hydrogen conference in Brussels. I participated. I think we never had so many people in one conference in Brussels with 600, 800 people. So hydrogen is an important issue. We had done in the IEA last year, June, a major hydrogen report for the G20. So hydrogen is not only a European issue or in some of the EU countries, the hydrogen strategy, which the commissioner mentioned, which will come up soon. But it's a truly global issue. Japan, Australia, US, and many others are also pushing a lot uh, on hydrogen. There are different colors to hydrogen. There are green, there's blue, there's dark, there's even pink, I read. So what I can say is for the time being, hydrogen is 80% made out of fossil fuels. So there is only a very small uh, part of hydrogen which is made out of renewables right now. It's possible, but it's still quite costly. It's really expensive. So one thing is, and I think there's an excellent chance right now when we speak about sustainable recovery, hydrogen strategies and so on, to put some government support, some money as well uh, in that green hydrogen. Then we can hopefully with scaling up hydrogen, green hydrogen, renewables hydrogen, then we can bring the cost down. And that I think what Fatih meant 10 years ago when we had the recovery from the financial crisis, there was a lot of support, government support, but also financial support on solar PV and wind, which brought us a little scale up and we can see now they are extremely competitive and prices came down. So hopefully that is also the future for hydrogen. We need to bring the cost down and get the scaling up. And then I think there is a really good future listening to what is happening in industry and governments and the announcement made and looking forward to the EU announcement and hydrogen strategy to have it also a renewable hydrogen strategy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mechthil, and uh, I can certainly only agree with what you, you just said. I mean, there is a, a lot of discussion about hydrogen, and uh, we have already also uh, made the analysis in our long-term strategy towards uh, mid-century uh, uh, full decarbonization, and, and we know that in order to, to achieve that, we need uh, a very uh, substantial part of hydrogen. We're talking maybe between 10 and 13% uh, hydrogen by that time and as you said for the moment we only have very little and what is more what we have today is practically all hydrogen which is uh, produced on the basis of fossil fuels which are not really contributing to decarbonization as such so I think that the question is really uh, very relevant because obviously uh, the real 
point of promoting hydrogen is to contribute towards uh, decarbonization. And hydrogen there has the advantage of being able to decarbonize sectors that are otherwise very hard to uh, to reduce emissions in, uh, like certain parts of industry and maybe certain parts of, of transport as well. So it is a very important part of uh, the Commission's work for the moment to try and work out how we can make sure that in the long run, we do get the right kind of uh, hydrogen uh, onto the market. We probably need to look at a stepwise approach, but I can't say that much more about it because as you know, it's work in progress uh, and you will have to bear with us a little bit more. We are hoping to bring this out uh, uh, by 8th of July. That's the current uh, planned adoption date for this uh, strategy. And there we will probably be able to roll out a little bit more what, what it takes to do that. But, I mean, one element, I think, of this is to make sure that we are able to distinguish between different types of, of uh, hydrogen so that uh, we, can, we, can, we know what it is that we are doing and not just promoting any type of hydrogen. So um, I would uh, leave it maybe uh, there. And uh, there are some questions about nuclear and small modular reactors, which is... Uh, of course, always a, an interesting topic, but nuclear also tends to be a very divisive process so, uh, item. So maybe I would actually go to the question from Benjamin Strelecki, which is about carbon price, which is seen as uh, the best, at least by some, the best solution uh, that could be implemented to achieve fast results to reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, will this scheme come about at a global scale? I think that is the, the question. So... Uh, Whenever we talk about a global scale, uh, Rachel, I, talk, I think about the IEA because you are global. Uh, so maybe you can have a first go at that one. Thank you very much, um, Hans. Just maybe to, to have one word on nuclear because uh, the IEA is working on all fuels and all technologies. And nuclear is a low carbon uh, energy source. And the question about SMR, small mod uh, modular reactors, is part of our VEO special report where we have a small chapter on SMR in the context of innovation and technologies, which could bring forward some of that uh, uh, low carbon uh, resources uh, also at global stage. There are already quite good examples and a lot of interest in those countries who are uh, uh, promoting nuclear and pursuing that. So we, we have done some analysis there and we have included it in our VEO special report and will do so obviously also in our ETP. The question Benjamin is asking about carbon price say six months uh, well and now uh, with the crisis obviously it has been impacted as well. The carbon price or the emission trading system is a key tool for climate policy and it can help to achieve reducing CO2 emissions depending on the carbon price obviously. And what I could add from an energy policy point of view it's an excellent tool, a key tool for climate policy but we also need other targets, promotion framework to make sure that, for example, we have renewables coming up, we have more energy efficiency, and so we can reduce CO2 emissions globally. We have some projects at the IEA to look, for example, for carbon pricing in China, an ETS system in China. So China has started introducing an in a few sectors at the first stage, a kind of ETS system. Uh, and we are advising them and we work together on this one with the EU um, because of the ETS uh, experience. So there is a lot of work going on together with China, which I think is a good, in good starting point. As we know uh, from an energy and a climate point of view, reducing CO2 emissions, we have to look at the big emitters like China, India and others. 
Carbon pricing is also uh, happening in Canada. They have uh, a federal system, but also uh, the regional system, which had lead, led to very good results. And we know, I think, roughly 30 countries and regions who have introduced carbon pricing. And I think the schemes are somewhat different, but there is a lot of best practice, best examples coming from the ETS. So I think we cannot have one scheme at a global scale, just to finish on that one, but there are very good initiatives uh, based on a carbon price to reduce CO2 emissions, and that has helped certainly when we look at the, at the sectors involved. And I know there are some reflections also uh, within the European Green Deal to look at how to extend ETS to other sectors to reduce CO2 emissions. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Maxil. Uh, I think that was a very comprehensive uh, reply to that. Just maybe to complement from the EU perspective, uh, here we have, of course, always pursued, shall we say, a dual approach, where on the one hand we've had carbon pricing, but at the same time we've also had specific policies aimed at promoting energy efficiency and renewable energies, which of course also ultimately lead to lower emissions, and that has actually worked quite well. Uh, we are now looking at uh, to what extent we are meeting our targets for 2020. Uh, we're not quite there, but but almost. And then with the crisis, the things become a little bit more blurry and perhaps not so clear cut. But the system has worked quite well. What we are now looking at is, of course, uh, how are we going to move forward uh, from 2020 up to the carbon neutrality by the middle of the century? Uh, there we are conducting a new impact assessment uh, that will uh, hopefully be ready uh, sometime in the autumn, which will look at uh, um, the situation in 2030, what kind of uh, emission uh, reduction target do we need to set ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, currently it stands at 40 percent, but uh, Mrs. von der Leyen already said when she took office that she believes that it needs to be increased to 50 or maybe 55 percent. And then, of course, that raises the question, how can we how can we achieve that? And as you said, Mathilde, indeed, in the Green Deal where this announcement was made, there was also the idea of uh, extending current ETS to, to other sectors, which we are looking at and which will, of course, be part of that analysis. So it's a, it's a complex uh, uh, story. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, complicated modeling to find out what is the most uh, cost-efficient way of reducing emissions. Uh, and CO2 uh, pricing is certainly one of them, but probably uh, it's not a standalone uh, uh, thing as such. But where I would certainly agree with uh, the, 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 the person who asked this question, Benjamin, is that uh, it is important that this is extended to a more global scale because otherwise it does distort competition. And that's, of course, uh, something we, we, uh, we do not want. And that's why the, the Commission has also been looking at how to address that through some kind of border tax arrangement. So, but, but that's a different story that probably we will not have time to get into uh, now and here. Uh, maybe we can just take one question, and that's uh, the one which is also quite a popular question, which is about uh, batteries, uh, looking at life cycle carbon uh, efficiency of uh, the ion batteries. Um, is The question is, is electric vehicles really far more carbon friendly than conventional car? If you, I suppose that, that is the meaning of the question, if you look at this from a life cycle perspective. So, uh, Mechthil, would you want to have a, a quick go at that one? It will have to be a little bit quick because we don't have that much time left. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Hans, and uh, thank you for the question. So, as Dr. Fatih Birol was mentioning, and I think there is a very common line that the key technologies for the future, there are many, but uh, two of them, hydrogen we spoke about, and batteries. And the battery alliance of the EU and bringing all the players together is key. And we see a lot of happening. New battery uh, uh, factories uh, so that prices can go down. And I think it's a fair question uh, to look then how is, how is that related to electric vehicles. The, a week ago, the IEA came out with a global electric vehicle outlook 
which obviously everything is impacted by the crisis um, and certainly also the car market where we saw uh, and the estimation for that year a uh, reduction of car sales globally all cars by 15 percent but in our estimation and analysis in that global electric vehicle outlook, electric vehicles would remain more or less at the same level in 2000, as 2019. So EVs will suffer less from the crisis than conventional cars as it looks now. And the uh, increase of electric vehicles in the last years has been very steady, including in China in particular, but also Europe and the US. Obviously, when it comes to the question if it's more carbon friendly than conventional car, we have to link it where the electricity is coming from. And if it's clean electricity, green electricity, uh, renewables electricity, obviously that is the case. If it's coming from less clean sources, then the question about a life cycle based uh, efficiency analysis comes into place and that's what we uh, have done in the JEVO and then there is a turning point on how the electricity which is going in, in EVs as such uh, is clean or is it coal based and that makes a huge difference obviously than in the carbon friendly less than uh, compared to others. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mathiel. I think we could probably sign up to every, everything you said there from the commissions point of view and you know we are a big fan of uh, life cycle uh, emission analysis i think that is the only way of doing things and that's why for example also in the battery alliance we have put a lot of emphasis into producing batteries that are more environmentally friendly that you're talking about trying to produce the world's greenest uh, batteries uh, in Europe once the production here comes up and, and running. So I think that is a very important part. But of course, what you said also about the source of the electricity that is feeding into the electric vehicles is, is really important. I'm afraid that that's uh, probably what we can have time for in terms of Slido questions. But I think we're now going to finalize on something which is something I've never tried before. It's called the word cloud and some of you listening out there and watching out there will probably be more familiar with this than, than me, me but you need to, to type in uh, the first word that comes into your mind uh, in terms of replying to the question how to mainstream innovation and then hopefully there should be some uh, words appearing I see we're having some slidos back on that's very good but in fact what we wanted to see was the word uh, cloud so hopefully that will come because that was what we had in mind uh, in terms of uh, closing. So the words are coming up now. So we'll just give it one or two more seconds. And I think these are then, Mechthild, you can maybe select some of these as your speaking notes for your closing remarks. Um, I think there are very many important words coming up now and uh, sort of I guess the, the the size of the words uh, indicate also how many people would have suggested these words so maybe so, while they pick up uh, Mechthil could I ask you maybe just uh, in much much more than 30 seconds to uh, to give us your closing remarks on this session and what, what you have heard. I know it's a bit hard, but uh, I'm afraid time is is a bit uh, running here. Right, it. Thank you. Let me maybe make three, three final remarks. I love the work innovation and technology are key to clean energy transitions. So on the 2nd of July, our ETP innovation report will come out and you will see a lot on how to speed up innovation cycles what are the key technology? What are the framework? And I see the framework, uh, legal framework, policy framework as quite big in that cloud uh, selection. So uh, I think that that what we have uh, done here, it's, it's a huge analytical work scenarios uh, in the longer term, what needs to be done from coming from a prototype to a demo and then be commercially. And I think how can uh, governments accompany that and give the right framework and education? Secondly, 
Let me thank the Commission for an excellent uh, cooperation on innovation and technology. We have different committees, we have different uh, technology work streams, and we are mutually, I think, learning from each other on the work done at the EU and very much looking what I heard from the Commissioner on that technology and R&D strategy in autumn. And if the IEA can give more input as a global energy uh, agency, uh, we are happy, obviously, to continue that excellent cooperation. And last but not least, if the hydrogen strategy and the um, sector strategy comes out on the 8th of July, as Fatih mentioned, we have the 9th of July, our summit, so an excellent opportunity for both Commissioner and Vice President Timmermans to come back, in particular, on one of these key issues in the recovery and in the clean energy transition. So, but let me finalize by the word innovation and technology. I don't think there is enough said about it. And there's the analytical part on what we can do, but we need all players together, uh, governments, but also companies, social uh, and educational uh, systems to make it happen. Thank you very much, Hans. And I really enjoyed that session. Thank you very much, uh, Mechtid. Uh, I think the enjoyment was fully on our side also to have both uh, you and uh, Dr. Birol here. I think it has been a, a very, very stimulating uh, discussion. I think it has really highlighted how important innovation is in terms of the energy transition moving forward, accelerating and getting us to where we need to be in terms of uh, uh, reducing our carbon footprint. And the, the, the session i think has been very very popular with the uh, people out there one of the most popular sessions during the whole week and i think for good reasons because it is so important to get innovation uh, into the right kind of things the commission is doing quite a lot of work on that right now we are hoping to publish a publication on that uh, later this uh, autumn where we would look at the sort of technology readiness of various technologies that are critically important for the energy transition and of course, as you said, Mehdi, we work very well together uh, with the IEA on this. I think uh, the, the complementarity of the Commission and the IEA uh, in this sense is, is really great. So it has been very nice to have both you and uh, Dr. Birol here today. And I think also Commissioner Simpson enjoyed very much listening to Dr. Birol. They have quite a few engagements, I think, uh, this, this week. So they will get to know each other. Maybe at the end of the day, she will also try to understand better his love of football. Uh, so I think that's all very good. So I really uh, now would like to thank you. I would like to thank the, um, the people who have attended us uh, virtually. Uh, as you know, this is the first time that we conduct the Sustainable Energy Week in a virtual format. But so far, I must say, I'm uh, quite uh, intrigued by uh, how we can do this and the interaction that we can also have uh, through the Slido app and, and in, in other ways. Uh, so I think it has been a great pleasure also for the Commission to do this, and we look forward to continuing this uh, cooperation. So thank you very much again, and enjoy the rest of the sessions. There will be sessions, for example, on hydrogen and judging the, the interest in that. I think that's something. Uh, also in energy efficiency, renovation, various types of renewables, energy system integration, and so on. So there are lots of very interesting stuff still to come in the Sustainable Energy Week. So please do hang in there and tune in and uh, try and get the most out, out of this. Thank you very much again and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you and bye-bye, Mechtid. Thank you, Hans, and uh, thank you all for listening to us. Bye.